I guess the next question now that you're all excited about EUAs is uh, the, the big question is show, show us the money. Um, so um, we are to demonstrate just how easy it is to access capital, as Scott mentioned, we've not got one presenter, we've got two this morning that are trying to find homes for their money. So I'll introduce to you our two, uh, our tag team of finance presenters this morning. Um, Ashley Robertson, who's the Associate Director of Environmental Finance Solutions for NAB. Uh, Ashley is an Associate Director with NAB's fin environmental finance team. He has more than 10 years' experience across project finance, leading in environmental finance advisory activities, including arranging finance across the energy power and infrastructure sectors. Current areas of focus include renewables, energy efficiency and embedded generation financing. He has been working on the development of EUAs at NAB, amongst other environmental financial products, for over two and a half years. And our second presenter is Mark Yates. Mark is the Director of Financial Services for Low Carbon Australia. Low Carbon Australia was established by the Australian Government in 2010 as an independent company with approximately 100 million uh, initial funding. Um, low Carbon provides financial solutions and advice to Australian business, government and wider community to encourage action on energy efficiency and cost effective carbon reductions. Low Carbon's mandate includes a requirement to leverage funds utilised and achieve a commercial return, hence funding models are primarily established with financing partners to offer a blended finance product to the market. Now in his current role, of Director of Financial uh, Services, Mark operates within the energy efficiency program of the corporation, which includes development and implementation of financial products to fund energy efficiency asset upgrades, primarily in retrofitting of non-residential property and industrial processes. Uh, Mark currently manages financial partner relationships with, with Macquarie Bank, the NAB, Eureka Funds Management and Funding Models Incorporating, uh, EUAs, Operating Finance Leases and Structured Project Finance. So can you please join with me in, in welcoming um, Ashley and Mark. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction and uh, thank you very much to the Government of South, South Australia amongst, amongst others. Uh, the banners in, included here for uh, the opportunity to talk here today. Uh, my name's Ashley Robertson. I'm from uh, National Australia Bank and this is Mark Yates from Low Carbon Australia. So today we're, we're just going to walk through uh, a, a couple of the financial elements of EUAs um, more broadly to start with and then we'll, we'll get into a bit of detail about um, the EUA that Dominic mentioned earlier today that, um, that the ink is still uh, getting dry on. Uh, so I might just hand over to Mark first but um, on behalf of NAB we're very excited to be here, very excited to see EUAs uh, being developed here in South Australia and look forward to a, a really good relationship over time. Oh, good morning. Um, as Scott mentioned earlier, uh, both Low Carbon and NAB have uh, established a fund for financing of uh, EUAs, uh, approximately $60 million in the in the current fund. And uh, our overview today is to focus on the financial aspects uh, of the EUA as a product and also look at how the uh, financier views the uh, EUA product in the market with the various stakeholders. Um, so starting from that point um, and drawing on some of the discussion that's been held earlier, uh, you can see that there are quite a few uh, groups within the, the EUA framework that uh, are drawn upon. Uh, the building owners and tenants, uh, sustainability bodies such as the, the Green Building Council, um, financial institutions, consultants and service providers who can be uh, good originators um, from project perspective for EUA funding, um, industry associations such as the, the Property Council, uh, the State Government and Councils and uh, groups such as ourselves from a, a financing point of view also. Um, and as mentioned earlier, communication amongst those groups is paramount and um, as Dominic sort of pointed out with regard to lead time in getting projects off the ground, um, the fact that uh, in South Australia you're engaging with all these different groups at an early stage to try and get the message across and communicate the product and its capabilities in the market is a very positive step um, which I think will assist in, in reducing those sort of time frames. Um, we've spoken a little bit earlier about uh, what EUAs can be used for but just giving a, a bit of a broad overview on sort of the technologies and, and sort of projects that, uh, that are looked at. Um, they're primarily focused on energy and water efficiency um, from a project example perspective here. And the broad message, particularly in the New South Wales legislation, 
is that the EUAs can be used for any water and or energy efficiency works being undertaken. And examples are, uh, say, tenant lighting, which is the, the low-hanging fruit that uh, Scott sort of referred to earlier, um, with short payback periods and immediate cash flow benefits to the building owners and the tenants. And uh, typical projects for base buildings are things such as uh, car parks, lift motors, uh, car park foil lifts, uh, lift motors, um, heating, ventilation and air conditioning, a uh, particular one, glazing facade improvements, which uh, we noted was uh, an item that was raised in the uh, South Australian report around uh, building fabric and uh, uh, the heat issues um, that occur here from a climate perspective. Um, co and tri generation systems and plan improvements for the buildings, such as chisels, boilers, um, building management systems, and cooling towers. Now, uh, these uh, technology areas um, will have different payback profiles and different uh, components of hard and soft costs, which is a focus for. Um, uh, us from a financing perspective and for other finance um, alternatives in the market. Um, we've just given here a bit of a breakdown of examples of the payback periods for some of those technologies. Uh, say for example HVAC um, is sort of in that five to seven year range and has uh, a low breakup of hard and soft costs and what we're referring to there is the hard cost being the actual uh, costs associated with the equipment whereas the soft costs are more the ancillary costs like the uh, consultants fees, the actual installation costs and perhaps some of the software associated with its operation. Now financiers in uh, different financing products will have a look at the hard and soft costs associated with the technology um, and say with leasing for example they'll only do say uh, uh, a ratio of 70-30% on hard and soft costs and the EUA um, from its financing structure one of the components is to look to get around that um, through the, the security position that the financier has under the EUA structure. Um, other examples say for the paybacks lighting which is short payback periods and then the longer payback periods out to areas such as um, the cogen and trigen and solar say in that 10 years plus. So these were items that were looking to be addressed in the finance structure for the EUA looking at the payback periods associated with the technology and trying to match the finance product with those payback periods and also getting around the, that hard and soft cost breakdown that might be an impediment for the, the finance structure as well. So as mentioned earlier by uh, Scott from a, a structure point of view, the EUA, we have three parties involved, the council lending body and the uh, commercial building owner, um, and the, the flow through for uh, financing from the lending body to the uh, building owner, um, the charges that are levied by the council, paid by the building owner to the council, the council then passing on those funds to pay back the finance to the, the lending body. And the items that we're looking to try and address from uh, an issue point of view, the cost and length of financing, um, based on some of those other issues discussed earlier. And in the second component, the split incentive, whereby you're looking to get some uh, recovery of the cost from the, the tenant of the uh, um, capital outlay that's been done on the project. So looking at the first one, the EUA uh, can reduce the funding cost and increase the term of funding from uh, the finance perspective. And the, the key benefits from the structure, um, there's no security required. The financier has what's termed a, a super senior position in that uh, um, a statutory charge rank, ranks in front of the, the first mortgagee on the site. Um, so the financier under an EUA structure is uh, very comfortable with where they rank from their security point of view. Um, and therefore no additional securities are uh, undertaken uh, other than the, the statutory charge that's been levied on the, on the property. Uh, there's no financial covenants. Normally in a, a corporate loan you'd have ongoing financial covenants around perhaps um, uh, interest coverage ratios or loan to value ratios associated with the funding on the property. Um, that's not required under an EUA structure. Uh, we can look at terms up to 10 years um, as discussed earlier and that assists in um, being able to match your uh, project uh, um, technology with the payback periods. Um, there's no refinance risk. Um, you might find with a corporate loan on, on property generally it uh, will not be amortising, it's, it's primarily interest only, um, so there's potentially a refinance risk at the, the back end of, of that financing structure. Um, the EUA structure is fully amortising over the, over the term of the EUA. Uh, it's a fixed rate for that term of funding as well, so uh, you're able to lock away that rate. Uh, it's non-recourse back to the lender other than a, a limited indemnity there for adverse change in law and similarly limited recourse um, 
from the uh, council's perspective uh, back to the, the building owner um, because it's limited to the, to the building only from a, uh, a security point of view. Um, we're able to look at passing on the cost of the EUA to tenants and there's potential for improved financial performance uh, in the debt and equity and interest rate range at the moment on, on EUAs that have been undertaken have been uh, within that sort of 6 to 7% range and that's been on the, the longer term funding so you're looking at 10 year debt within that range which is a, an exceptionally good rate uh, in the market as it stands at the moment um, and as mentioned earlier the ability to get 10 year money for project funding um, in the market is, a, is a, a very positive step in itself. So looking at the second issue, the split incentive and how that's addressed, and we've looked at here uh, as an example a building with a, a five-year weighted average lease expiry on, on net lease conditions. So if we look at sort of an um, uh, initial scenario where no action is taken, um, it doesn't work for the, the tenants or the building owners in that the uh, doing nothing, um, your, your economics from the building owner's point of view worsens as the, um, uh, the neighbour's rating potentially deteriorates and you uh, look at having issues with uh, releasing and that can potentially lead to, to lower rents so you've got a negative um, uh, capital position potentially on your, on your property and from a tenant's point of view um, the economics uh, worsen is they're paying higher unit costs for, for power consumption associated with uh, uh, the lease on the property. If we look at the impacts on um, debt and equity uh, which is the, the business as usual uh, investment for undertaking capital expenditure um, this is the classic sort of split incentive scenario where the owner's wearing the capital charge and you can see from the, the arrow's point of view going left to right, um, the outlay occurs and then you've got a, a negative position for um, the owner being the red arrows, uh, eventually getting to a, a positive position as they start to recover some of that cost at the, the five year lease expiry um, through improved rents due to the improvements associated with the, the work undertaken on the property. And for the, the tenant, um, they're pretty much in a better position from day one. They get the benefit of the capital expenditure through the, the lower operating costs, as can be seen from the green arrows, but that reduces over time as the uh, owner of the property will then look to increase rents, but you've still got the improving uh, operating cost position as the um, power consumption continues to go up uh, from a cost point of view. So looking at the EUA and how that benefits both parties, um, the building owner gains via recovering some of that capital charge or all from the, the tenants as, and potentially releasing at higher rentals on completion of the lease, which is your green hours improving over the, the five year term. And from a uh, tenant's point of view, uh, they're no worse off than the, the um, uh, business as usual scenario. Um, and in fact, over time, um, they benefit from a, a escalating electricity savings outweighing the, the constant cost of the EUA servicing over the, the period of the, the EUA. Um, just looking at a, a couple of the examples of the EUA agreements that have been undertaken to date, the 123 Queen Street and 470 Collins are projects that have been undertaken in uh, Melbourne, 10 Valentine Avenue recently signed in Parramatta in New South Wales. And the focus here is just looking at the, um, the drivers for each of these parties um, for undertaking the EUA. And um, as can be seen sort of from the bottom down here, uh, cost and tenor of funds was a particular driver um, looking to match their uh, uh, term with the uh, technologies involved. So for 123 Queen Street, you've got a tri-generation system, lighting upgrade and, and facade upgrade. So it was longer term payback for those. Um, and uh, boilers and cooling towers there, again, longer term paybacks. So 10 year uh, length of EUA was very attractive, as was the cost associated with that. And then for uh, Valentine Avenue, it was a lighting upgrade and had a shorter time frame that there was still a, a, a better cost and an ability to, even at five years, is still uh, not necessarily a, an easy term to get in the market currently for, for finance. And there was the ability in this instance for tenant pass-through uh, due to discussions between the, the tenant for the building and the, and the building owner. So looking at the process from a, a financing perspective and just why um, it's not necessarily that different for, say, your standard corporate loan, um, the building owner scopes out the building and estimates the, the works and power savings in the, in the initial step. Um, the building owner and council in uh, New South Wales undertake a, a, an application process. The financier completes a credit process and that's an abbreviated process. So um, simply looking at, uh, because it's a low loan to valuation ratio associated with uh, the works being undertaken in that super senior position, simply being a rates charge, 
Um, the repayment is via the council and uh, um, it, that can be uh, shortened from a, uh, an application perspective too if it's the incumbent bank that's undertaking the, the EUA as well. So if NAB were the financier on the, on the property, it would be a, a very shortened um, credit process. Uh, the building owner and financier agree a letter of offer. Um, it's a 10-page template. Um, again, a similar sort of process that's undertaken with the uh, standard corporate loan. And uh, agree the, the EUA. Uh, the EUA is a template document, so it's not designed to be amended. So um, uh, you have a standard boilerplate document there, so it should assist in reducing the time frame involved in um, review and completion of the document. And the annexes are customised in the the document which um, gives the, the project details for the specific project involved. Um, the conditions precedent that need to be satisfied um, will be no different generally to uh, what you require for a, a standard corporate loan um, and that's around uh, such items as uh, we're referring to there, signed purchase agreements and construction contracts, that's uh, around the purchase agreements for the equipment and the construction contracts for undertaking the, the project. Um, the building owner will finalise the work scope, sign the, the purchase agreements, construction agreements and letter of offer in EUA and uh, monies then are advanced under those terms and repaid each quarter from uh, the council after the works are completed. So the only additional steps in there are two and five and basically all the other uh, areas are, are normal for funding but the, the benefits associated with this process are um, lower levels of documentation than a standard corporate loan and those uh, lack of ongoing uh, covenants and requirements um, associated with uh, the EUA. Um, and I'll just pass over to Ashley now who will have a look at the uh, EUA process and its application to uh, the 10 Valentine Avenue project in Paramount. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Um, so uh, this project is uh, 10 Valentine uh, Avenue Parramatta and essentially uh, this is first uh, EUA in New South Wales and it's a it's a lighting retrofit for the tenancy space and uh, as you mentioned up there there's a, there's a couple of firsts here that we need to talk through. Um, the second point being that probably the most important one which is that this is the first EUA with tenant pass through and what that means is that the um, the product goes from being a, a product that focuses on that first issue that Mark was mentioning the um, cost and availability of funds to a product that has a, a, a full and complete um, value, and that is both cost and tenor uh, uh, value, and then also the, the ability to recover from the tenant some of the savings that they're be benefit, benefiting from. So who, who, are the, who are the key parties involved? Uh, building owner is Australian Unity. Um, the tenant is uh, State Property Authority of New South Wales. Um, which essentially is the, um, the central point for all the tenancy space that the New South Wales government um, manages uh, within New South Wales. Uh, the scope of works was a, a tenancy space lighting upgrade, so basically the replacement of the lights and the fittings associated with those lights. Uh, the capital cost, uh, we've rounded up here, but um, in the broad range of about a million dollars. Uh, the EUA term was five years, um, which is a, a bit different to the, to the precedent um, EUAs that have been done, which were a bit longer. Uh, the estimated energy savings was $110,000 per annum, uh, and that's purely in uh, electricity savings. And then there was a neighbours up uplift, which, which doesn't look very big on its face, but um, we'll, get, we'll get to that, and uh, it is actually quite a significant increase. So um, it, it's actually good that uh, Mark and I are co-presenting today because we actually provide co-financing for EUAs, so it is quite, quite appropriate. So what happened in the case of 10 Valentine is that Low Carbon Australia and National Australia Bank uh, funded uh, the retrofit of the lights. And um, as a result of those, uh, of that, those works, uh, energy savings which will be, will be produced and um, importantly, the EUA agreement, and this is what I, I really want to focus on today, the EUA agreement really acts to regulate how those savings are uh, split between the tenant and the building owner. And by doing that, it actually creates a comfort level for both the tenant and the building owner to engage. And that's something that may not have been there previously, and it is something that actually should kickstart investment in this sector. Uh, so key parties there. 
So what are the, what are the key takeaways here? From, from both a tenant and a building owner's perspective, you have a cash flow benefit. So, um, and we'll, we'll spend a bit of time just going through that today, what exactly is that cash flow benefit? Um, from the tenant's perspective, it's really an alternative to a, a rent review. And, and a rent review can be a, a very uncertain outcome for both the tenant and the building owner. Uh, it lacks the transparency that, that may otherwise have been there um, to give the tenant comfort to start engaging in that process. Um, and it also led to the tenant op occupying a better space. Uh, in the case of the New South Wales government, uh, like uh, all governments uh, in Australia, they have minimum uh, standards of, of tenancy space uh, uh, from a, a neighbour's rating perspective. And uh, what, what uh, the EUA can be used to do is, is to really bring up all this space at a collective level um, to, to, to actually uh, qualify and better manage their space and make sure that they're compliant with the, the obligations and regulations that, that the government has put on themselves. Uh, from a building owner's perspective, cash flow benefit, uh, competitive cost of capital, uh, the, the tenant engagement and retention was a, was a key thing here for the client. So, so Australian Unity have, have been at pains to say that the one, the one very good thing about this program is that they got to sit down with their tenant and the tenant walked away with something that was very, very um, beneficial to them and that creates a, a lot of retention for both Australian Unity at that site and also their engagement with, um, with government at other sites. Uh, the last tick point there is a potential valuation increase that we'll, we'll touch on a bit later. Um, so going back to the, um, the, the tripartite slide that um, both Mark and uh, Scott have gone through today, um, if, if we just focus on and step out how this works specifically for 10 Valentine. So in the case of 10 Valentine, the lending body will advance uh, money, approximately a million dollars in two drawdowns, and that money will be repaid, or it will be repaid uh, every three months over time, and it'll be repaid as a fixed amount. So as a lender, we, we will advance the money to the building owner the same time that we advance the money to the building owner the council will create the charges associated with the repayment of that loan. So in this case, you have uh, quarterly repayments from February next year for five years of approximately $50,000. By doing it this way, and um, Scott touched on this quite, quite nicely today, but, but it really gives uh, NAB as a, a lender a, a lot of comfort around um, repayment of that capital. Um, and whilst we have a, a priority uh, in terms of the, the statutory charge on, on the land, what we, what we do need to do is, and B, is a patient creditor. What we know is that whilst councils have uh, the ability to actually go in and sell buildings, we know that at, uh, compared to normal lenders, uh, they can be quite patient and it, it can take time. So whilst we have a statutory priority and we have a lot of certainty that we will eventually be repaid. Um, there is liquidity hurdles within this product and uh, Low Carbon and ourselves have worked out a way to get over those problems and uh, come up with a, with a, a cost-effective uh, financing product. And so then we move to the, um, the second part of the, the, the puzzle and uh, that's the tenant, so uh, State Property Authority uh, on the right-hand side there. So. As part of the arrangement under this particular EUA, uh, they'll be enjoying savings of at least $30,000 per quarter because of the works, and essentially that is $30,000 of electricity savings. Um, so each quarter for five years, they're agreeing to, to the extent that they're saving, so the extent that the, um, that the, works, that the lights work, uh, the tenants agreeing to actually pay 30000 of the 50000 through to the building owner. The building owner then collects that 30,000, adds 20,000, and then pays 50,000 back through the council to the lending body. So the key thing to think about here with, from a tenant's perspective is it's an initial quarterly electricity savings, but there is legislative protection there. So what we're really saying here is that if, if the lights don't work, um, then we have a regime to actually measure it and um, penalise it. If, if, uh, if, if, it, if it's not forthcoming. And this creates comfort for the tenant. So alternatives to the EUA. Um, this, is, this slide's a bit similar to the one that Mark went through with the arrows, um, except what we're saying here is that there's there three alternatives here for, to an EUA. Like the tenant could pay the lights themselves, 
But in the case of the New South Wales government, uh, like most governments, they have funding constraints. If they did that for every single site that they're up, up against, uh, it would be in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, the light fitting replacement uh, itself, so not the light, but the fitting itself, uh, there's issues there around tenor of, of lease time and uh, who actually owns the light fitting. Uh, the second option would be the building owner themselves pay for the upgrade. And there we run into issues around split incentive. Owner would pay for the work but would have to wait for a release event to, to uh, recover. So the third option uh, would be the tenant and the building owner enter into a negotiation. And so this could be outside the, the regime of an EUA. And certainly that's, that, could, that could easily, easily happen. Um, but what we've found is that um, both parties are not willing to engage on, on a broader level. So tenants will typically pay to enjoy energy savings via the rent increase. So in this case, Australian Unity and State Property Authority would meet. They'd agree that as a result of this lighting upgrade, the rent would go up by five, five or ten dollars. So what would happen in that case is that um, when the State Property Authority is, is negotiating with the building owner, they're really reliant on escalation assumptions for both the rent and the power prices um, negotiated. And if the upgrade does not perform, the tenant could be itself exposed to performance risk. Uh, and then uh, that last point there is, is really a specific point around the works. So uh, Mark, in his first slide today, went through what works actually qualify. And, and one of the qualifying things that councils actually put on an EUA is that the works must be to Australian standards. And that actually creates comfort again uh, from, from both the tenant and the building owner's perspective that, that we have something that is um, deliverable and reliable. So uh, in summary, the, the EUA brings transparency, government precedent and involvement to a delicate negotiation. This gives comfort to the tenant to engage and commit. The EUA gives competitive funding costs to the owner and partial recovery of funds from the tenant prior to the release event. And this leads to a cash flow benefit. The EUA will also give some cash flow benefit to the tenant, which I'll, I'll go through on the next slide. So when we talk about cash flow benefit, um, just focusing firstly on the building owner. Um, so his benefit uh, prior to the release is that he can recover the $30,000 per quarter from the, from, uh, from the tenant. Uh, which is the savings. There is also a benefit there from a cost and tenor of funds advantage and uh, you know, given interest rates are at a very low point at the moment, um, locking in your rate for 10 years at the moment uh, makes a lot of sense. And then there is also a cash flow benefit for the tenant. So in this case the, uh, the $30,000 per quarter is actually based off the saved electricity uh, uh, savings. And uh, what's left behind and what is not taken account of is the, uh, the maintenance savings. So in this case, there was quite significant maintenance savings anticipated from actually fitting out or replacing the lights that are in a le less, le less, frequent, uh, less frequency. And this leads to some, some benefits there from the, from the tenant's perspective. So looking at it from a uh, net present value perspective, uh, a simple, thing, simple way to think about this is that uh, for 10 Valentine, there was approximately $600,000 worth of savings um, as a result of the work. So whether you used an EUA or whether you used your own cash or you used a loan from a bank, you had $600,000 worth of savings. And they roughly split 80% into electricity savings and 20% into maintenance. So the, the issue always becomes, well, how is that split in an equitable way? So what the EUA does, and under its regime, it, it, it comes up with an effective regulatory regime, if you like, uh, to split it in a way which motivates both parties. So in this case, the building owner benefits and has 67% of, of the savings and uh, the tenant has 33% of the savings. Um, we must remember that the under an EUA, the building owner has a capital obligation. So it physically owns the light fittings and the lights and uh, that covers the debt burden. Uh, so once, once uh, year five finishes in this case, um, it's, it's likely that uh, uh, the, what would happen next is you would have a traditional uh, rental renegotiation at the next rental point. Uh, the owner would have a potential valuation increase. Uh, I mentioned four and a half to five stars. Um, 
whilst it's a, only a small in terms of, terms of the star rating, this graph actually emphasises that it actually can lead to quite a big increase in, um, in the, the percentage value of yield on the building. Um, I might, mightn't go through this slide, but uh, this slide is really about what went well and, and what could be improved uh, in terms of the financing. And uh, the broad message is that the EUA template held up well. It had um, uh, uh, legal parties on both sides who were negotiating it quite heavily and quite hard. Um, and the template held up well. Uh, there's a few things that we can improve over time. The last point's really, really um, we need a bit more money, I think, and funds allocated to marketing for the product. And I think sessions like today really help. Uh, I won't go through that. I think Scott went through the evolution of EUAs. Uh, just to note that you know, we're not work, working in isolation here in Australia on EUAs. Um, the US and the UK have similar schemes. Uh, in summary, uh, very broad application. Um, NAB and low carbon have money available to, to spend. And uh, we look forward to your support. Thank you.